Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Nurturing Astrology Podcast. I'm Dominique Jaramillo, your host and astrologer, and I'm here with Cornelia Henson again. Hi, Cornelia. Hi. So we're going to do something or try something a little bit different. We have one show a month where we're talking about a particular topic, and we are asking our community to send in questions around that topic that we can then address in a Q&A show. So today is our first Q&A show around the topic of reframing tough transits and aspects in the natal chart and retrogrades. And we've had a couple of um, family members submit questions that we're going to dive into today and give you some general insight that we think can help everyone and also these lucky um, families, maybe some a little mini reading or some insight, additional insight for them specifically for having um, generously offered their questions and charts for our class um, or our for our show. So just as a reminder, I'll walk you through from the original show, Reframing uh, the Tough Transits. You can check that out. It was episode two. But the main key things what we talked about were expectations, attitude, and approach, which is really mm-hmm. important, right? In terms of approaching any challenging aspect in a chart, because it's so easy for us, especially as parents, to go down rabbit holes of like fear and concern about what it could possibly mean or how it could possibly manifest. And after us kind of talking about this and going through our our thoughts about it, one of the things that really jumped out at us was parents, as parents, we have to be really mindful of projecting those fears onto the child's charts, right? Right. And really it always come back, it always comes back to us and our own charts first that we want to always be looking at in terms of how we are really um, knowing our own energies, our own temperament and our own approach and also our own fears and concerns and worries about our kids. And are we are we exacerbating things that no, don't need to be or worried about things that are out of our control ultimately? You know, where do we really have control and can make a difference, right? Right. And so for these particular uh, charts, the things that jumped out were squares, obviously. Those are challenging aspects when you have squares that then create T squares where you have an opposition and then that a square, um, two squares. So that creates a T square configuration, which can be like a pressure cooker. So anytime Mm -hmm. you have that kind of aspect, you're looking at, you know, places where we feel at odds within ourselves And then like this sort of pressure cooker or tension that we have to deal with. And also whenever you have planets on angles, which we'll have in in the examples today, you are then all four angles are then sort of affected or touched in some capacity. And you end up with a cross of some sort, right? Whether it's a cardinal, mutable or fixed cross. And so you can research the, the, um, If you have planets or your child has any planets on any of those angles, you could research sort of how that type of cross manifests. What are the benefits or the gifts to that particular type of cross configuration, right? And then look to see where there can be a release point or an outlet for that energy and a positive approach to um, navigating it through it, right? Because it's there forever, consistently. It's something they're always going to be learning about. So some general tips in terms of looking at this, I'll outline, and then we're going to go in, I'll actually share some slides and some charts, and we'll go into like these little, you know, three or four uh, mini readings here in this um, with their questions. So first we want to look at the planets and the signs that are involved in the heart aspect then note, you know, what those represent. So for example, if you've got Mercury square Saturn, you know, there's going to be some sort of challenge with learning or communication perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can note the element or the modes and the modes that they're, that are involved in that expression, because those can be experienced and observed, right? Fire and water with the emotions and the air just needing to talk. Like, and also sort of the stubbornness or persistence of, of fixity and or the distractibility 
in the mutability, right? <laughs> so those things can be observed too and understood through temperament in general, which is obviously foundational, right? Always again, looking for that release point where we can, you know, find a way out or direct that energy in a positive way. Right. Yeah, I think I think probably uh, some astrologers, maybe the newspaper ones, have given this negative feeling about oh Saturn's coming. Oh God, what a terrible thing! But we need Saturn because he does a lot of positive things too. So it's easy to look at the negative side, but always remember that there's always a positive side. So how can I use the positive side of this energy? So. Exactly. And I think with any tough transit or any tough aspect you're looking at in your natal chart, you're looking for how can I use this energy in a positive way? And where in the chart are there maybe some outlets uh, to direct that, you know, help balance that out or help integrate that challenge. And it's, um, it's, it's necessary ultimately for for the, the larger picture. And also we have to remember, speaking of the larger picture, we have to always look at the whole chart, right? Yes. We can't yes. look at anything in isolation. So it's really interesting and, and good. And it's a good place to start to go, okay, let me look at this planet or let me look at this configuration and let me build out from there. But we do have to build out from there. We can't stay in that one configuration and, and not, and, and also get stuck in what that might mean because there is so much going on and we're all learning and we're at different levels of our learning, our children at different stages of their growth. And so there's all of these different things that are playing into possible manifestations of a, a configuration at any time in their lives. Right. Mm -hmm. And we even get into that a little bit in terms of like, you know, something on the angle and potentially, um, affecting them when they're younger or at birth rather than like, and then manifesting differently in life down the line. Right. Right. Well, it's also, it's a, a journey from birth on. So you have progressions and you have solar drills. Progression can show you things change. Like your sun goes out from Taurus and enters Gemini. There's a whole new feeling to that. So you get that Gemini energy that's new to you and, oh, wow, that's great. I can use it in a positive kind of way. Exactly. So it's always progressing, right? Yeah, we get like, like getting helpers, right? Yes. <laughs> You're getting helpers. Like you're, they're born in that tough configuration, but then things come through and they progress and change, especially when their personal planet's moving. And then all of a sudden there's this additional energy that's coming in to assist. You know, right. so not, that challenge is not fixed there for life to where it gets no support at all. Right. It's no, that's the whole thing. It's helping us become who we really are. Right. And we have to look at it with that a flexible attitude, okay, that nothing is either bad or good, but it's somewhere lies in between. And our job is to kind of figure out how to balance these things uh, to make life easier for us. As I know I've had to learn to balance Uranus square Saturn. Okay. And one wants structure, one wants freedom, you know, and right. too much structure makes me burst out. So I have to learn how to balance those and recognize those when I need to take time off and not keep pushing myself on something too long without taking a break. Nice. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's dive into our example uh, questions and charts for today. Okay. So here we are with our example charts. So our first one, can you see that Cornelia? Mm -hmm. Okay. So our first child here is in the top left. This is our child and this is a six-year-old, six and a half-year-old boy. And over here is mom in the middle with the child around. Okay. And this mom was asking about the Pluto Venus square and how this might manifest or create some challenges. Um, in relating for the child and how she can, you know, work with that or what she can do to help. And immediately we notice that this child has also Uranus opposite creating what we were talking about before a T square configuration. Right. Right. So share with us a little bit about the T square and this configuration from your perspective there, Cornelia. 
Um, well, I think this has a lot to do with relationships because here you have Mars conjunct Venus in Libra, which usually means there's difficulty in relationships. And here it's dominated by Venus because it's in its own sign mm -hmm. and Mars is in its fall. So Venus tends to dominate. But the continual question is, is how much freedom do I have versus how much do I go um, cooperate with this person? And he's got this, this opposition to Uranus. So, okay, what does that mean? Uranus brings in with Venus usually um, those kind of instant fall in love, a magical kind of uh, relationship. The problem is that it's usually not stable. Mm. Okay, but it's got a square to Pluto. Now, what does that mean? It means that you get into intense, intense relationships with somebody where, uh, especially a square, there's a lot of tension. Um, and Pluto can be all consuming. So we'll be getting into relationships uh, maybe from an unconscious purpose uh, to learn about Mars Venus relationships. Okay, when, when is it too much? When is it not enough? Uh, so that's a big test that, he's, that he has from this T square. But. Um, and as a child, so this is how this can manifest when he gets older. And as a child, right. this can manifest as, you know, figuring that out and testing relationships, you know, when he's young. And even right now, we know that, you know, he could be testing things even more because we know that Jupiter and Mars are currently in Aries and setting off this T-square, right? So right. at six and a half, he's going through a certain, you know, um, natural growth period where he's headed into that first Saturn square at seven, right? And starting mm -hmm. to test authority. And it's being exasperated. I don't think she was saying that she was, um, he was getting more aggressive when he was trying, she's trying to discipline him. And, and, and so he's not maybe abiding by rules and, and structures in the home and things like this and bucking the system to test how far he can go or not, right? <laughs> so when we look for a way out, we look to a trine or a sextile. And he has this grand earth trine that I have pointed out here in blue between Pluto, the moon and the Jupiter in Virgo, right? right? So this is where he can actually learn, you know, how to find, to slow down. And he doesn't mean to be aggressive in a negative way. It's just really about wanting to love, wanting attention, wanting to feel secure, you know, all of those natural things. It's just learning how to do that and it coming across maybe ag aggressively and with Mercury, um, Sun and Saturn, because we do have to look at the whole chart and Jupiter, you know, rules this, um, this trio here, there may be some struggle and some challenges to communicate and share you know, in a way that is um, understood or feels, you know, that it isn't aggressive or it doesn't come off as a, as a lot, right? And, and uh, we were speaking even about the square to Neptune being part of this scenario in terms of, you know, having this beautiful imagination, but they can actually get away from him or have a hard time, again, uh, refraining from all of that. Um, right, and I, I think that falls in with the Venus Uranus too, because you can tend to idealize things when you have a Neptune square Mercury. Yeah. Uh, you tend to, oh, this is, this is the great princess, you know, oh, she's marvelous. There's nothing wrong with it. Everything's <laughs> wonderful. But we know that it can't last because sooner or later she'll do something that'll remove the illusion and then follows disappointment. Right. So and he has to be careful. Right. And, and we learn about relationships from our, from our parents and modeling that. And with Venus and Taurus, you know, mom is going to be an example of, of relationship, right? And if we look to the synastry over here, we can see that that Pluto is at the midheaven for her, right on mom's Neptune and sun. And then that T-square lands on her ascendant, descendant axis, as well as the moon opposing Pluto 
and the moon opposing Mars. So they have this own configuration where they both, she understands the need for freedom and, and as well wants it for herself, but also the value that she understands about finding a balance, he hasn't learned yet. Also, he has Jupiter in the fourth. So we know that he has, uh, he has had a good foundation from mother mm -hmm. in terms of feeling that the universe is okay. Yes. And yeah. so he trusts her. And that's another thing about this. Uh, the outlet to this is goes to the moon in Taurus. So she represents, if you look at both charts together and look at this grand trine, she is the person that's going to manifest to him patterns and relationships. So she has a lot to do with teaching him about relationships when he has a friendship and maybe it doesn't last or something, you can talk about the relationship or why it didn't last, et cetera. So you're there to teach him about relationships and how to balance them. And also that the most important thing in relationships is to be able to trust your partner. So that requires you to always approach a person with total honesty and, and be uh reveal your feelings and talk about them without trying to hide them or mm. misconstrue them. Yes, honesty is the best policy and yeah. building trust. And so when she creates a trusting, safe environment for him to share with her and being you know, responsive to that and helping him navigate his feelings, that will then transcend into how he navigates relationships as he gets older. Right. Right. Any final thoughts on this one? I think well, that I think it's, I think it's important to recognize that Aries uh, Libra across the first seventh because yes. that's just a natural space. So one has to learn about um, relationships, no matter what, when to give in, when to cooperate, and when to uh, stand on your own ground. So yes. somebody doesn't over dominate you. Right. Right. And that. They both have Venus and air signs, you know, Venus and Aquarius for mom, Venus and Libra for, for him. So they, they can talk and share their feelings and, and um, find it's a, a relate well, you know, and right. bond through that. And she will be a really important example because she also needs freedom and independence in her relationships, but wants to have a healthy balance and wants good connections and you know strong foundations and a nurturing home and she wants to provide that for her family right. so this is a way where she is an example of that and helping him learn how to establish trust in relationships with others as by providing that foundation of trust with her right, right? i think that's good okay so now we're going to move into three quick charts of another one of our parents has a question about aspects or what we call malefics in astrology or hard aspects to the fourth house cusp. All right. So each of, she says, I can't help but see that each of my kids has this negative or hard placement on their angle associated with roots family and feel fear around something happening to either myself or their father that causes great hardship for them during their childhood or upbringing. Please help. Thank you. So we'll look at the first chart here. And her first son is a nine-year-old boy. This is her oldest. And she's speaking to the Saturn in the fourth conjunct the uh, IC. So each of her children has something in this placement that she's concerned about. Okay. And we'll go into each one quickly or a little bit more, but quickly we'll give you sort of an overview that the first thing that jumps out to us is looking at mom over here and the child around. But the mom ultimately, with all the children, has the most water and is the most, um, you know, needing that security and safety. And she also has that worry about her family, right? And that concern mm -hmm. as a mom and her Mercury and Uranus is in Scorpio, right? Mercury rules the fourth. So this is where she has that deep concern, but she also has the ability to go to worst case scenario, right? She, she, she has this imagination. So she does have to be mindful 
that um, and trust that the children will be all right, that they are here on their own journey and that there is a, a need to sort of make sure she's not projecting fears onto the child, right? right. So Definitely. we noticed that, we noticed that, but well, let's talk about this first one with Saturn here, retrograde in Scorpio on the IC. You want to give that a go um, for us? I know you had some thoughts. Well, about I've, that. I've found quite often that when you have planets that are right on an angle. That means that affects all the other angles at the same time. Right. Uh, so here we have Saturn. Uh, it would be squaring uh, the ascendant. It could be a possibility of some difficulty with the birth. Sometimes with Saturn, you see a restriction, maybe like the umbilical cord around the neck. Um, which takes some, some time to undo that problem before the child has a full birth. Uh, another possibility is uh, since it's her first child that maybe there was a grandparent involved mm -hmm. in taking care of the baby, okay? So it could be a lot of different things, yeah. but um, it affects that um, Mercury, Mars, Sun conjunction up there in Taurus because Saturn is opposed to all of them. Yep. So what does that mean? Mars and Saturn is kind of like having the break, the break on at the same time you've got the accelerator on, you know, it kind of goes back and forth and jerks. Mm -hmm. uh, so there might have been that involved. It's hard to say. There's so much uh, going on with that Saturn. Um, but I don't see anything. I think that it works out okay. Um, Saturn trines the Uranus up there. That's good. Yeah. And we look to, for the outlet, you know, what is the way out of this? You know, when you've got a, a cross like this, and this is a fixed cross, it can be right. like a pressure cooker. It can feel, you know, uh, tough, but we look to outlets and there's lots of different outlets to it. You know, the, the Uranus trying the ascendant and then Pluto over here trining the sun and Mars and even Mercury there widely, right? That, that stellium up there. And if you notice it also sextiles Saturn. So there's a mutual reception and a sextile here between Pluto and Saturn. So everything does work out. Everything will work out. It's like having this ability to having this, you know, powerful placement to really help him overcome challenges, work through any challenges that right. might come up. We obviously, if there was any struggle at birth, he's nine, he's good. He's here, right. That he overcame that struggle, but there is that, um, that placement there is that he's always going to have that ability to, you know, work through anything that any challenges that come up and find and with find the moon in the seventh house that again goes back to mom mm -hmm. searching for a partner that has the the same kind of attributes that his mother does and here you can see he's got the moon in aquarius and she has uranus conjunct mercury yep uh which is very uranian so uh he probably sees her that way. So he'll want an independent woman that'll give him breathing space. Nice. Yes. And maybe that's the way he sees mom is that she's more, you know, they're like friends and they get along and there's this, this um, openness of communication or she definitely like wants to keep the lines of communication open. And, um, and we noticed too, that all the children, because of, you know, generation that all of the children have, um, Chiron and Pisces. So there's yes. this, you know, this oneness that they're all seeking to feel. And so by communicating with him and them in sort of including him on even her, what she's interested in or studying or, you know, that kind of thing can um, really help him to feel even more um, confident in his own uh, ideas or feelings about right. About and that, that moon trines Jupiter in the 11th. So with Jupiter in the 11th, I would think that he would make a lot of friends. Yeah. Uh, so it would be worthwhile for mom to watch how he relates to other kids and how this chart shows up in different ways uh, that he makes friendships and how he deals with them. And you right. can help him with that right. also. 
And if we're talking about her concern in terms of like uh, with father or parents, you know, having sort of any struggle in the home, I would say that, you know, that Saturn there, it could represent retrograde in Scorpio, this need to have a sense of um, security and safety in the home and being mm-hmm. with, and I don't know if that, if you point to necessarily father or mother or the primary nurturer or the grandparent, you said, even like where they get that sense of feeling really safe and, yeah. and uh, comfortable and, and having that ability to own their own power and their own authority and find kind of find that out. So what is, what is the role model that um, that father is playing in, or even this, the parental axis, as we call it, we're going, we're going to do a show on that, right? We did that show. So Scorpio Taurus here, you know, they can see the parents, um, and particularly maybe the father, whoever that authority figure is as really powerful. Yes. And will play a huge role in how he feels about his own, um, how himself and also his ability to communicate or, you know, be like, um, strong, like dad or be understood, you know, that opposition with Saturn and Mercury, would you say too, that there's this challenge in communication and also challenge to feel safe to communicate, or if there is a challenge, not being, you know, um, feeling bad about that or being made to feel bad about that as more of a, you know, as a debilitation, but more about how to find ways to work through those challenges, overcome those challenges and how they can make us better. Those things that, that which does not kill us makes us stronger kind of thing (laughs) Exactly. in life. Right. Right. But I do think with the parental axis here, there is maybe a feeling of not being completely understood or struggling to feel understood or mm-hmm. struggling to be like everyone else in the family, maybe. Well, but I look at the parental axis also, the rulers are, are Venus and Taurus and Pluto and Capricorn. So right. that's trying by elements. So that doesn't look to be a, a big problem as far as their upbringing goes. Excellent. So there's, so there's this positive outlet if you're looking at Saturn, you know, opposing there if you look at the rulers of the parental axis and you're kind of getting a key into that next episode too you look to those rulers and they're in good aspect so that's not Mm -hmm. a problem so there isn't maybe a negative manifestation of that so again this could be her worrying about something that she doesn't really have to worry about exactly and with a cancer moon she tends to worry anyway yeah and if there are (laughs) challenges with the learning or with anything like this they can be overcome they can be worked through there are um, resources and approaches and practices that the child you know they can find for the child that will help them work through any of those challenges and they'll ultimately be better for it stronger for it right right yes Okay, great. So let's look quickly at her next child is six and a half and she has a daughter, right? This is a daughter. And her concern here is that Pluto down there on the third house cusp retrograde, which again, creates another cross, right? We want to be aware of because it's right on an angle and this is a cardinal cross and it also squares that ascendant like to the degree that ascendant descendant access. And uh, what was your thought again, again, about potential um, birth? Uh, Again, it's, uh, uh, there may have been some difficulty in it and before the birth. So maybe they, uh, because it Uranus is on the seventh house squaring it, perhaps uh, there was a problem in the birth that they had to, uh, it could have done, I found Uranus frequently means a cesarean section. It could have been. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Got it. Usually I've seen Uranus if it's on close to the ascendant or the fourth house because uh, that's what it involves. But it's hard to say from the seventh house. But yeah, uh, it's always around the birth. And you have to remember that the Pluto really is in the third house, right. uh, which gives them a very penetrating mind. Yes. 
which yes. takes you then, you know, to that, um, again, a Saturn in Scorpio, there's a mutual reception there. Right. And again, it's always helpful. It's always helpful. And also if we're looking for a way out, if we look to a positive, the chart ruler is Venus again, and we know this is relationships and there's a, a conjunction here, the Venus. Another, is another conjunction. Yes. Yep. And trying that Uranus in Aries retrograde as well. So this is a, a, can be a positive outlet, but you can't leave out the, again, the other ruler here is this powerful sun Jupiter conjunction in Virgo mm -hmm. because the, both the Mercury, okay, which is, takes you to the Virgo and then the Venus here takes you to the Virgo. So you've got, again, there's some struggle in these relationships, these like this battle between the confidence or feeling a lack of confidence in expressing yourself when you've got Mercury in the 12th there again, is can be a little bit of a like shyness in sharing their thoughts and feelings and ideas, but really wanting to, you know, that, that she, with this chart typically probably leans into that and leads with that Leo fun, lighthearted energy and very strong and powerful in that way, but then can actually have a hard time sharing the, the truth of, of how she feels. Exactly. Right. And it's, and it's that Mars Venus, which has to do with relationships is trying Uranus, which means that she needs a lot of freedom in her, um, relationships with people which means that she has to learn how so how to give them freedom mm -hmm. yes and this this one you have you have the reversal of mars aries she's got mm -hmm. libra so she tends more you would think that she would tend more to uh want to cooperate than be aggressive yes but then leo doesn't always act that way mm -hmm. and they're both both in leo so. Yeah. And the, again, there's this, um, this freedom thing that mom, I, you know, understands and gets right. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing that mom also gets that, that the children seem to need from her is to really understand how to communicate, how they feel, to be able to share openly and honestly about their deeper feelings and to feel safe mm -hmm. to do that. And if, you know, mom is on this, you know, journey and quest of learning with her son, Neptune in the ninth there in Sag, really loving to learn and explore and get into the deeper aspects of herself and know herself. It's almost like bring those, bring the kids on the journey with you, right. Mm -hmm. and, and show them how to do the same from this young age to really not be afraid to share what they're really feeling or, you know, own how they're really feeling and their power and the, and how that finding their gifts in terms of their strength and having strong feelings. And a, like you said, a penetrating mind and what that can do and what she can, you know, you want to know how things work. Yeah. Getting into that, like that's a providing that um, outlet for her, right. Is what, right. Is, what really gets her excited or turns her on and wants to like, what she wants to explore and get into and learn, you know, and where she's going to put that mind to, to good use. And she may work behind the scenes. She may be, you know, really into um, research or health, you know, or even, you know, animals for that matter, right? Like pets and then might be really like into animals with it yes. being that sun Virgo. Right. Yes. Um, and that, uh, Hygiene and health, hygiene yeah. and health too. Yeah. Diet. Yeah. And the uh, the Aquarius moon here is also opposed that conjunction of Venus and Leo. So, you know, she can have fun with her siblings, right? They get mm -hmm. recognize they're all going to kind of want to do their own thing. And mm -hmm. uh, this is the middle child. So you got that yeah. middle child of wanting to keep, you know, wanting to find where they can have, where they can shine and have their, their time in the sun or their, their free time to do what they want and 
not always caught in the middle or maybe they, they become sort of the peacemaker and like they let you know the middle person that helps everybody kind of get along like you said what needs to be done to keep the keep everybody um happy and the, and um and everybody getting along and and uh peace in the in the home right yeah so again, coming back to the concern about that Pluto on the fourth house is yes, this is a powerful position and it is going to have an effect on the personality and the life, but it's something to be embraced as again, like a power source and, you know, finding ways to nurture that sense of personal power and the power of her thoughts and minds and what she's capable of doing and creating and um, mm -hmm. in terms of mom and dad, again, you have like Capricorn cancer. There's a traditional, um, axis here. It's in opposite position, but sees par right. both parents as, you know, maybe she sees again, dad as more of a powerful, uh, energy with Capricorn there. Um, again, the other child has Saturn in Scorpio. So again, you have that sextile, that mutual re reception. So it's not necessarily, a negative, but they may see either the father as more of the stronger um, authority. Mm -hmm. And it could simply just be that or the one who's out working or, you know, gone more or, you know, mm -hmm. they look up to or as that authority figure. But it doesn't yeah. have to, again, mean something negative. No. At all. <laughs> and everything will progress anyway. And everything progresses. And so energies come in to help soften some of those harder placements as we grow and learn and figure yeah, out. Yeah, and I are. think when squares move into trines, then you get to resolve those, whatever they are. Right. Or come to a better understanding. Right. And we're looking at, you know, a six and a half year old child. So they've got a lot of living to do. Right. Yes. <laughs> but this gives, you know, a little bit of foresight and also a, a, a place for the parent to recognize that there is less to worry about than maybe they feel they need to yes. at this point. All right. And quickly, we'll just look at the third child. This is a three and a half year old child. And she has Chiron here with Mars in the fourth. So she was concerned about this because it's also a powerful placement on the fourth house cusp around that home and family energy. And again, you have a, so the square here. This is actually a mutable t, uh, t square, not T square, but a mutable cross. So there needs to be some stability. And this is a Capricorn, strong Capricorn child. So there is also this need to balance that freedom and security. It's like you want to break free and have fun, but I don't know. I don't want to follow the rules. So you look to the, the outlet here and the interesting thing about the outlet here is it creates this water trine. There's a trine to Venus and Scorpio. Interestingly, it comes back to a Venus position, Scorpio um, energy, which was similar to the other two children who have Saturn and Scorpio. So there's this undercurrent of emotion and feeling nature that may not be as easily seen or exp um, easily expressed, right? Or mm -hmm. comes out in feeling like hurt and um, not real sure how to, um, to share those deeper feelings in a way that isn't, you know, an outburst here or there with the Mercury in Sagittarius and the Jupiter in Sagittarius right on the ascendant, mm -hmm. you know, it's fiery, fun, bubbly, energy but with all that Capricorn there's again when you it's almost like having that blind spot that neighbor where you're like I I know I should you know I need to be doing this but I really want to go and do this and that struggle to to yeah. balance that fun with yeah it's right like the Virgo thing. Leo you know we have two signs that are next to each other they don't have much in common so there's always this friction like which one are you going to follow and which is the more powerful mm-hmm when Saturn there is just in its own sign, so it it's uh, and Pluto there and Pluto is also so it's it's the conflict between Saturn and Jupiter here. Yes, and ultimately you have Mars there conjunct Chiron in Pisces, 
And again, there's this in the fourth house, which is um, family and roots, like she was asking about, and the parental axis being Pisces and Virgo. So there is, again, this sort of need to feel um, safe to explore what's going on beneath the surface and emotion-wise, or honoring the inner struggle, if you will. And whatever, again, whatever um, mom's learning or her spiritual journey is something that can be very influential on the children. Yes. And I think uh, you also have to realize that that Mars and Chiron trying the North node. So this is here for a reason, okay, for her future. So she's going to be moving towards that North node in Cancer mm -hmm. uh, and away from the Saturn and Capricorn. Uh, yeah. So she's going to be moving in that direction. Yep. And again, mom can certainly understand the nature of this child easily. You've got that Venus and Scorpio is right on her Uranus Mercury. Then all right. that Sag falls on her Sag. And then the right. Capricorn falls on her Venus. So again, there's, right. you know, great connection. And then the Neptune on her Ascendant, Mars in the first. So all this is, again, connection where mom can play a role, simply a positive role, simply by bringing the children along on her journey right. of personal growth and, ex and exploration of all the things, right? <laughs> of all of the, of emotions, because we know that they all, all have air moons and mom has water. So mom definitely is more exploratory on an emotional level than the children tend to be. So she can be an example of how to really be open and free and exploratory with our inner life and our emotions and how that can be a powerful thing. What, what degree is her moon? Mom's is at seven cancer. Okay, so it's in the same sign. So mm -hmm. obviously that she's a, a pattern, uh, a role model for them as far as expressing yeah. emotions or learning how to express emotions. And the one thing we need to know always that with children, it's not what you tell them as much as what you ask them. Yes. <laughs> I the had written it down. You yeah. them, mm -hmm. How did that work out? How did that relationship work out with your son, you know, with this, with this friend? Or how did this work out? Always asking the questions and how did you feel about that? That yep. kind of thing. How did you feel about that? Absolutely. I love that. Yeah, because her moon, um, this child's moon is in Libra. So squaring mom's moon. Right. Right. But again, mm -hmm. if if there's this um, tension and understanding, ask questions. And with all yes. of the air, you know, these children, you know, are can communicate in that regard. They may struggle to communicate emotions. So asking questions can prompt right. learning about how to really help them through anything they're struggling with. Right. Well, this was good. Hopefully it gave um, anything, final words on that one? No, I think we've covered just about everything. I think, uh, I think this was a great a way to talk about these kind of things that parents worry about because parents worry about a lot of things. And with astrology, it's so easy to, you know, look in the negative rather than the positive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, part of human nature too, as men as parents to worry about those things. And when you've got challenges, you know, and tough aspects, those are also things that help the growth process. You know, a lot of times when there's a lot of ease in the chart, it's harder to make changes. It's harder. Then you have to wait for those, those progressions to move into squares to cause, you know, push them to, to evolve and change. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I do think that this is a lesson in focusing back on ourselves and making sure that we are being mindful of one, ensuring that we're not projecting or putting that fear onto a situation or something you see in the chart that mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, look for the possibility of growth and personal understanding. And then what you can do ultimately to help that 
journey for them is to work on your own journey and recognize, you know, where you can include your journey with them, where you can help your kids along the way with things that they are lacking or where you can learn from your kids from where, what you're lacking. Right. And I think that was a good example of that. So Thank you so much for these questions from our uh, community. And I hope that the answers have helped them individually a little bit extra, but also that it gives everybody some insight into the value of reframing these perspectives and looking you know, at one particular thing, working your way out, looking through at the whole chart and all the possibilities of manifestation and recognizing right. um, that it doesn't have to be a, a negative, but there right. is a positive um, manifestation of everything and our approach and our attitude, it makes all the difference. I also want to mention one thing. In the yeah, the last thing I wanted to say was that sometimes we go through a experience we would call negative and we don't know why. You always say, why me? Why is this happening to me? Well, what I've found is that we don't see the whole thing, but somewhere down the line, maybe a few weeks later, you'll see a connection. This had to happen before this could happen, and then before that could happen. So they are connected. We're just not allowed to see the whole picture. So okay. that's what we have to take these negative experiences is, okay, I'll know the reason for it. So, you know, but accept the fact that it's there to teach you something. That's all. Right. And even negative or hard aspects within our right. natal chart, the same thing. Right. We have to embrace them as signs of growing up. Yes. Or continuing on our journey. Right. Experiences. Negatively, yes. Right. Experiences that help us on our growth journey. Right. Right. Awesome. Well, this was great, Cornelia. Thank you so much. And also, if you like this format, you know, you want us to do these Q&As with all the topics and submit questions, like let us know. And, uh, you know, we'd like to do them and, and have this opportunity to teach a little bit more and do right. some real live examples that help you put it into context. And hopefully that these examples that our families have offered also offer you some insight and some direction and how you can maybe work with your own you know, thoughts or feelings about tough transits or challenging aspects in your child's chart. Um, and yeah, let us know how you liked it. And if you want us to do more of these, we would like to, if, uh, if they're helpful, right? Yes. All right. Well, What's thank our you. Next talk gonna be about? What's our next talk going to be about? We're going to be releasing the talk on the parental axis. That's good. So that's perfect uh, for looking at the fourth and 10th house cusp as the parental axis in our child's chart. So we're going to release that one in early July. So then, um, or sorry, yeah. Yeah, early we're going to release that one in early July. So then for cancer season, I thought that was kind of timely and perfect. Yeah. And then you can submit questions about you know, your own child's parental axis and how you maybe experience that or questions you have about it. And we did dip into that a little bit with this talk. Like we did look at that axis as part of the larger story since you had planets on the, on the IC. So we gave you a little teaser into that. So be sure to check out that episode and submit questions if you'd like to be a part of a Q&A like this for that topic. Right? Right. Well, thank yes. you, Cornelia. Glad we could do this. And we'll see yes, you all on the next one. Okay. Bye. Bye.